people often ask me, oh, did you find it hard raising money as a woman? And I'm like, I had people say to my face, I wouldn't invest in a business run by a woman. So many other people will think it and not say it or not even realize that they're acting on that prejudice. A few people put their hands up and say, oh yeah, I wouldn't invest in a woman run company. But the, the stats tell us. How do you take into account the people that look at Bitcoin and still say, I just don't trust it? If you step right back to look at the fundamentals of what it is, right? It is a digital way to exchange value. And that is absolutely legitimate. In fact, that's inevitable. And did you always know that you're going to be CEO? Progression was, ah, shit, my brother's done this thing. I need to keep him out of jail. Ah, OK, we've now grown really big. Um, someone needs to be the CEO. Oh, I guess it's me. Oh, we need to hire more staff. And then, you know, just like it just happened mm. gradually and organically. That's been a big learning curve. Give me some advice on like what should should we feel comfortable about investing in crypto right now? The most important thing is Kelda, thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. So how did you get into crypto? That's what I'm fascinated about. Because like if I like I like to be able to like I look at someone's CV and I can sort of see and I can go, yeah, I can see how that sort of happened. And if I look at yours, it's like strategic roles and big mm -hmm. corporate roles and you know, big four and the likes, and then bang, you know, startup founder. <laughs> Yeah, so there's the how I got into crypto and there's the how I got into easy crypto and they're, they're slightly different stories. The crypto one's a simpler one, which was I came across cryptocurrency Bitcoin um, back in, I think, 2014. And I sort of, you know, read about it on a forum on the internet and, um, you know, my background, I've done a degree in economics and I was like, this thing makes so much sense, right? Mm. We've got this global village with the internet, this global way to communicate instantly with anyone anywhere in the world, but we didn't have a global payment system. So I thought conceptually made a lot of sense. I bought some just to understand how it learned I mean, how it worked and to learn the process. And it was super complicated. Um, and then sort of I expected it would be the next big thing just because, again, the theory made so much sense to me. And for the mm. next couple of years, just literally nothing happened. Um, and I sort of forgot about it a bit. I definitely wasn't one of those active traders. I was just sort of more in it as for, for, for the novelty. And then 2017 was sort of when Bitcoin and blockchain started to come into public consciousness and everyone's talking about them and they're all over the news. And at that point I was working at a bank and um, because I had crypto, people thought I knew things about crypto. So they'd ask me about crypto. So then I'd go and Google and I'd sort of become the, you know, the overnight expert in crypto for the bank and ended up giving a whole lot of presentations and sort of talking and explaining to people how these things work and talking to, to employees and customers. Um, and then around that time, my brother had also gotten into crypto sort of in the, you know, in the year prior to that. He was buying cryptocurrency for friends and family because it was really hard and everyone was like, can you buy me this? Can you buy me that? And so he was doing all of this trading for everyone and he's like, there must be an easier way to do this. So he, he sat down and built this sort of first version of the website, this MVP of allowing people to buy crypto with New Zealand dollars really simply, really easily. And then he told me what he'd done and I was like, hold on a sec. So you're just selling magic internet money to strangers and with nothing more than just like a website and using your bank account. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, let's let's take that offline and let's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe let's think about this a bit. And so I came on board, um, I guess I think, you know, day six, six days after he'd started the website, I came on, helped with things like compliance, regulation, anti-money laundering, setting up a company, getting a bank account, getting, um, you know, customer support, like all the stuff that you wrap around a good mm. idea to make it a business. He had this great idea, amazing ability to execute but there's a lot more to a business than just a good idea mm. do you think i mean i'm i'm fascinated by this topic right because i always talk to founders and they're like oh you don't want that corporate governance sort of thinking and structure when you're starting a startup and i'm like well <laughs> you know the earlier you bolt it on the easier it's going to be in the long term but what so what's your take around like people thinking about like a maturity of the business in the long term in the earlier days is that something you think they should be thinking about yeah there's definitely like right times and stages for things and probably there are some things that are kind of unavoidable like compliance is one of them right like particularly if you've got a regulatory legal requirement to do a certain thing you shouldn't be ignoring that as a startup right like ignorance of the law no excuse um and definitely the earlier you put it in the better and in crypto in particular it's quite interesting like if you're a crypto user you've probably noticed over the last six months in particular there's just been this massive increase in 
compliance across the global crypto sphere. So, you know, you've got your big global exchanges like Binance are now, you know, asking for a lot more information. It's very hard to find anywhere that you could buy crypto without, you know, giving over your driver's license, mm. that sort of thing. And a lot of these companies have had to retrofit that compliance on, which is really challenging. It's not necessarily to say it's the wrong thing, but you want to be intentional about, do I want to start a business, you know, with this kind of MVP approach, and then later on, I might have to scale in governance and all that sort of stuff. When it comes though to legal requirements, I'd say definitely do those from day yeah. one. And probably that's one of the hardest things about starting a business is you don't know what you don't know. You know, my brother started this thing and had no idea that there was such rules of anti-money laundering that you might need to, you know, collect identity information from people. Whereas because of my background, I had a bit more knowledge and I was like, oh, I think we might need to look and do we need to do X, Y, Z. Um, and so, yeah, doing the, doing the requirements legally is really important. Knowing what the requirements are can be really hard when you're starting up. But the sooner you build in those foundations that enable you to to have that, you know, more mature business, the easier it will be in the long run, I mm. think. What did you learn when you jump into a startup six days into its infancy <laughs> and then coming out of like corporate world? What, are you, what did you learn? What were there some things that you found hard what were the things that you liked everything was hard right and i think this is one of the things like you know people say hey startups really hard but like it's so much harder than you ever expect mm. it will be and i think part of you know for alan and i we didn't intend to create a big business we just like he was just solving a problem i was just helping him out it kind of was quite organic we didn't you know um we, we didn't go into it looking, okay, how can we create a business? What can we do to, you know, make a make a big, you know, entrepreneurial thing? It was just sort of accidental almost. Um, and, but, you know, that, that lesson around everything is hard. It's like, it's hard in ways that you don't necessarily expect. Like, for example, for us in crypto, it's really, really challenging to get a bank account. Um, you couldn't get insurance when we started and we couldn't advertise online. Like, you know, all of the digital media channels were closed to us. So when you think about starting a business, you're like, oh, yeah, set up a company, get a bank account, mm -hmm. do some online advertising. Like, we couldn't do those things. Um, and so it was hard in ways I didn't expect. But then you've also got like the you know, the wins that you get and the, the amount of growth and learning that comes out of it is incredible. Like, I wouldn't change it for the world. Like, the person I am now, having gone through the startup journey, created this business, learned all of these things, had all of these challenges. Like, I'm a, such a... Um, yeah, ch challenge gives you growth. And so I love the growth that I've had through the business, even though it's been incredibly hard. I'm very different from who I would have been if I'd just stayed in corporate. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how it's like sliding doors moments, right? Yeah. Where you're like, I wonder what my life would have been like if I had to stay down that path and now it's like down this path. But uh, I could never go back to corporate, right? Like I just love running my own business. I love the um, the independence, but also the creativity, the you can just get shit done and you know mm. anyone who's worked in corporate can know that sometimes you you know you have all the amazing ideas don't necessarily make it through because there's just so many layers of process and challenge and risk and everything whereas when it's your business you're like yeah we're gonna do yeah, that yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah i love that i love it. i got so many friends that like leave startups go work at a bank and they're like oh yeah I culture one, shock right i have one mate who um he left a CTO role, went to like a C-level role at a bank and he was so struggling to get things done that he was mm. like, I'm just going to do a day like a car wash where we just everyone can bring their ideas through and we can just like at least pick a couple of ideas and just get some stuff done. And then the auditors came in and were like, no, sorry, you can't do that yeah. because we haven't done this. And I'm like, oh my God. And I that's the thing, right? If you're at C-level and you're struggling to get stuff done, like that's, that's systemic issues. You can't just... Yeah. yeah. How do you expect anyone else to be innovating, right? Um, what's been the best thing about it? like so what do you because i imagine new zealand's like a small fishbowl right mm. and we all sort of have some like people like blow up really quickly and they're like holy shit you know and they're everywhere is that is that hard like is that something that you've had to like learn how to like speak at conferences or be the be in the room and when there's all these people come, coming up to you or is that something that's always come natural to you or no, I think I remember the, the very first sort of public speaking thing I did um, was, you know, when I was working at the bank and people were like, oh, Janine, tell us about crypto. And they they asked me to come and speak at this event and there was like 400 people in the room and I had to explain what blockchain and Bitcoin were. Mm. And I remember like just before I was going on stage and I was shitting myself and I was just like, I can't do this. Like I can't get up and speak in front of all those people. Um, but I did it and you know, it, it was, it was okay. And then like, I, you know, I'd do something else and then every little bit you do. And I remember the first time I sat down for an interview podcast like this. And again, like I was terrified. Um, but every bit you do, you kind of build your confidence and you, mm. you know, can help, you know, just extend yourself that little bit more, that little bit more. And now like, I really love public speaking. I enjoy it. It's like actually, you know, fun and interesting for me. And that's a skill I never would have uncovered or known about if I hadn't had this opportunity. Mm. How did you know to commit to this one for Easy Crypto? Like, what was the moment you're like, all right, this isn't this isn't a thing that I'm just doing anymore. We're committed to it. 
The, I mean, the first comment was just around, oh, shit, my brother's done this thing and he has not thought this through at all and I've just got to jump <laughs> in and keep him out of jail. So that was my first commitment point. Um, but I think when it got to the point that, because I, I kept my full-time job and I was just doing this nights and weekends, so Alan was full-time in the business. He was traveling around Southeast Asia, so very low cost of living, yeah. just working from whatever beachside hammock he found himself on Sounds for the lovely. day. Yeah. I know, right? And I'm slogging away back in Auckland, doing the commute, doing the nine to five. Um, and just like, you know, I was spending all every night every weekend was just solidly working on this so it was a real hard grind but we sort of needed the consistency of my income once we started employing staff because crypto is so unpredictable yeah. business is risky and it's like we needed to make sure that we could keep the business going then it got to a point where and this was around the time of covid where i was like the business is actually making enough money that i have the choice now to leave my full-time job to go into it and financially you know we're going to be okay and so that was a really cool commitment point i guess was mm. having that um the financial ability to do that. There was never any shortage of work, <laughs> yeah. but having the financial ability was great. And it was really good timing because COVID hit and um, crypto just went nuts. Yeah. Like the, you know, the markets just took off and everyone was really interested and engaged. And so it was really good timing for me to be full time. Yeah. And did you always know that you're going to be CEO? No, at beginning, Alan and I were just, we just started the thing together. Um, and also, you know, it was initially he had slightly more equity than me because he'd started and I'd come in on day six, right? So mm -hmm. we, we split unevenly. And then over time, we're like, actually, we're 50 50 on this. And so, you know, we went 50 50 on the equity. And then um, when it came down to, hey, who's CEO, we sort of, we kind of kicked that decision down the road for a while because it wasn't really, it wasn't immediately clear and it was sort of it was his idea and then i was just helping but then over time we kind of realized that actually personality wise skill wise that's a hundred percent my jam and yeah. zero percent his jam and it was a pretty easy decision once we sat down and actually looked at it and, and you have a phenomenal career as well like you've done some really interesting great beefy beefy roles yeah and and like all of those like it's interesting right like i've never had a career plan i'm not one of those people like i want to be this and here are my steps to get there but mm. i've always just sort of gone with the approach of you know the next right step i guess and if you take roles that are interesting and extend you that sort of builds out and builds better foundations for the next thing to come and so it was really interesting stepping into the ceo role at a fintech startup that i look back over these different things in my career and i'm like i've learned all of these skills got all these different building blocks all of these things along the way that i've picked up very um eclectic different things have all really contributed and helped me in this role so it was a yeah. really cool um yeah background to bring into it awesome so if people are listening to this and they're like all right i'm trying to be a ceo of a fintech or i'm creating a startup and mm. i don't know if i should be the ceo like what is it what does the ceo role look like fundamentally like what are you doing the key things I guess everyone, you know, can define it differently, but there's some core components, which for me, a really big one is leadership, right? Like my team is everything in the company and like, you know, we wouldn't be here without a team. So I want to be a really good CEO for, for them. Um, and for me coming out of corporate as well, you know, I'd worked in so many jobs that I just hated coming to work or I'd go and hide in the bathrooms because I just mm. couldn't face like the next 10 minutes at my desk. And like, it can be soul destroying being in a, in a job that you hate. And so as a leader, I really wanted to make sure that my company was a great place for people to work and that people turned up and enjoyed their jobs, were passionate about it, were fulfilled by it, right? So for me, that is absolutely the first most critical component of being a CEO is being a leader and being a, you know, creating a good environment for your team. Then obviously you've got- Have you always been a leader? Like, have you always been a good leader? <laughs> I've never been a leader before. This is one of the really surprising <laughs> things about, you know, being thrown, you know, you know, it was like progression was, ah, shit, my brother's done this thing. I need to keep him out of jail. Ah, okay, we've now grown really big. Um, someone needs to be the CEO. Oh, I guess it's me. Oh, we need to hire more staff. And then, you know, just like it just happened mm. gradually and organically. And um, I never would have expected that I would be sort of leading a team of, you know, currently we're 50. We've been 100 in the past. And it's like that was not my skill set. I'd never managed people before. I'd never been a team manager in, in any of my jobs. I'd always just been a, a specialist or an individual mm. contributor. So um, that's been a big learning curve. Um, and I've realized also like I'm a terrible manager, but I'm a great leader and yep. they are very different things and very different skills. So the way my organization is structured, very few people report to me because I know I'm not gonna give them the best, you know, like, you know the things that you want out of a good manager like those aren't my skill sets but yeah. being a leader for the company like that's something i can put my hand on my visionary heart like, leader oh. culture yeah. Setter. yeah yeah and culture is really important like i think one of the things that makes a great leader is like genuinely caring about your team like i really care mm. about the people in my company and making sure like i said before like i want it to be a good place to work i want to you know one of the things that i take a lot of pride in is 
how many years of employment that we've created through this company, but not just years of employment, like people taking home a paycheck, awesome, but good years of employment, like mm. people are learning things, they're growing, they're thriving, they're enjoying turning up to work. I'm like, that's a super cool thing to do. Yeah, that's yeah. for me. That's culture is like this thrown around word, right? That everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to go to create a great culture. Mm. And I'm like, well, how, what is that, right? How, how do you define a great culture? And it's like, fundamentally, people just want to come to work, right? And, and every culture, every good culture for me is different. And I think you... If, if people are solving problems and they're doing interesting things and they're loving what they're doing, great. You know, yeah. but how do you keep that culture though? Like as you grow to 300 to 500 people, you know, have you started thinking about that or? Yeah, it's a really good challenge, right? And something that like for me, I think the starting point has been really intentional and that's where our culture started as a company in that, well, it, it started organically. We, when we got to about probably about a dozen people, I sort of looked at what we're doing. I'm like, man, we've got this company. We've got 12 people, most of whom have never met each other in real life because we're a remote first mm. company. All of these people who don't know each other but work really well together, completely have each other's backs, so are super helpful, engaged, and we just really enjoy the culture that we have. So for me, part of making sure we kept that as we grew was um, – yeah, firstly defining it. So sitting down and going, what is it that we love about our culture and what do we want to make sure we keep? And then labeling it because, you know, you can be like, oh, this is a great culture, but you need the words to talk mm. about it so that you can celebrate it, so that you can sell it to people coming in, so that you can say, you know, this is what we are and this is what we're not. And different cultures, you know, good culture is different for different people, right? But if you're really clear about your own, then people can opt in if that's what works for them. Yeah. And then lastly, um, being really intentional about, yeah, how do we grow it? So as we get, <clears throat> sorry. As we get past sort of, a, a, you know, a size where everyone knows each other personally and as we grow, how do we make sure that culture continues and that, you know, we have champions for the culture, we have mm. um, the rituals and the cadences that, that make it up and make it just embedded. But it, it is a challenge. It's a really interesting challenge. Um, but it's something that I, I think is, you know, going back to your question of what is the CEO role, I think that's the most critical one. Yeah, I think that is. I think you're always thinking about what the next stage is, right? And trying to make sure that people enjoy that next stage and yeah. feel inspired and want to come to work and, you know, and obviously profitable, of course. Yeah. Um, so for people listening to this that don't know what Easy Crypto is, I guess let's let's open that up. What like What is Easy Crypto? So most simply, Easy Crypto is just a way for people to buy and sell cryptocurrency. So if you're here in New Zealand and you want to buy like a little bit of Bitcoin, some Ethereum, anything like that, you can do that through our platform. Or if you're holding crypto and you want to sell it, you can do that and you'll get New Zealand dollars back in your bank account. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a wallet, which is a way to store cryptocurrency and it's fully self-custodial, which what that means is that you, if it's you, your wallet, you're completely in control of it. Easy Crypto doesn't have access to your funds. You know, there's no risk of us going out of business and taking your money with us. The funds are fully in your control, which is, you know, one of the really cool things about crypto. Mm. And then lastly, we also last year built a stable coin for New Zealand. So it's a New Zealand dollar that's digital. So it's backed one to one with real New Zealand dollars in a bank account, but it's a digital New Zealand dollar so you can use it for like instant payments anywhere in the world you can do things like smart contracts you know which is effectively programmable money which is quite cool and um, there's a whole lot of ways that I think stable coins or you know digital currencies will be really useful in the future as we start digitizing our financial products and services mm. do you think we're definitively there now like we're heading to that path or? no way I think mm. like I love this product because I'm like it's such a cool thing and I'm like I don't see a world where financial products and services don't digitize like having yeah. worked inside banking I'm like there's way too much like manual spreadsheets and printouts and analog stuff going on there right yeah. when you digitize stuff it's so much more efficient it's so much more um, accessible cheaper faster less waste all of that good stuff and so i think over the next decade financial products and services will digitize but we're not there yet like we've barely even started scratching the surface on that so it's a it's a long-term project that one but i think a lot yeah. of potential yeah that must be harder like you almost like I mean, you definitely chosen a, a tougher one, right, to take on because <laughs> it's like I feel like the Bitcoin world goes up and down like a yo-yo and you're like holding on at times and then you're riding at times and you're like, yep. I think everyone like talking about this recession, you, like Bitcoin's been like up and down dramatically over the last sort of 10 years. How, yeah, how and you, it has such a big impact on our business. Like, you know, for a normal startup, you're like, okay, we need to be able to budget our revenues. What yeah. are our sales going to be? What levers can we pull? And I'm just like... I, you know, I just give up, man. Like our sales will be what they're going to be and they will be 95% driven by what's happening in the market, which is a global market. And it's like, we just can't influence that. So we have to be ready to respond, but we can't necessarily influence, which is a very challenging position for a startup to be in. 
Mm. Can you market now? Can you put yourself out there more now with regulation? Or Yeah, it's a bit easier. Like there are still um, some digital channels that we can't access, but then others, you know, so Facebook we can advertise with, Google Ad- AdWords we can't, which is frustrating. But, you know, we just find the channels that are open to us and work through those. And to be honest, word of mouth is our best advertising tool and it always has been, right? And from day mm. one, we've had, you know, really great champions for our product from our customer base. And like, we love that. Like we love customers that enjoy our product, tell us and tell their friends. And it's just like, it's, yeah, it's how you know you're doing it right. Yeah, yeah. And what do you, do you see, are we in in a bull market, crypto market again, do you think, or? Not quite, like this year's had some really good, you know, this year's way up on last year. And the main drivers for that, um, in my view, have been the the ETFs. So Bitcoin and Ethereum have both now been given permission to be inside exchange traded funds, which are kind of like your managed fund products that you'd buy, say, from a shares from a hatch or through your bank. And so they're in the exchange traded funds in the US, which suddenly just opened up, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world can now easily access those crypto assets. That obviously helped demand and it also really helps with the legitimacy and the maturity and the, mm. the perception of the industry. The the market sort of, you know, they picked up this year, they've been, you know, relatively, you know, same, same price wise over the last couple of months. But the expectation from most commentators is for prices to pick up later this year because of the halving. And there's a whole lot of technical <laughs> stuff we could jump into and happy not to go there. But, um, you know, it, basically, it's just it's really hard to know. We're not in bull run territory yet. We yeah. think probably that will come later this year. But, you know, past you know, past a performance, no indicator of future returns. And it's like, it's really anyone's guess. Yeah. Talking about the halving. I think I've seen so many TikTok videos about everyone <laughs> telling me, buy now the halving. How do you, like one thing I'm keen to explore with you is like the legitimacy of your industry, right? Mm. That must be hard when you've got so many people that have made it hard for your industry. So many people doing really good things. And I like, I'm a big believer in digital currency as well. I think fundamentally it's the future, but it's just a long, long path there. And you've got a lot of rich old white men, you know, saying, hey, don't. Um, But how do you, how do you like take into account like, the people that look at Bitcoin still say, I just don't trust it, you know, and do you even listen to them or do you just get on and do what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, each to their own, right? But I think Bitcoin itself and the crypto industry itself, like if you step right back to look at the fundamentals of what it is, right, it is it is a digital way to exchange value. And that is absolutely legitimate. In fact, that's inevitable. You can't progress forward with our kind of digitally enabled world without being able to do value digitally. And it has this real nice difference from say, you know, like a MasterCard or a Visa or, a, you know, re- global governments, you know, creating that system is that it is decentralized, it's not controlled, it's really, it's free and democratic and open. And that's super cool. So like in a very, you know, helicopter view, I'm like, yeah, it's completely legitimate, right? Mm. But as you dive down, and particularly as you get into the layers of who are you engaging with on this, and that's where you have issues like FTX or, you know, um, that's it, closer to home, things like that, where it's like, that's what brings the challenge with the reputability of the industry is like, actually, who are you engaging with? And actually, you know, who is helping drive this industry forward? The other thing that I think is a massive, massive challenge, and the one that for me personally is just the, the most frustrating and devastating is scams. Mm. And scams are everywhere, right? They're all over your banking, you're, they're in your text messages, your emails, your phone calls, like scammers will use every avenue they can, but they, you know, crypto is a great avenue for scammers because pe- so few people understand it so they don't know what to look for they don't know how to you know protect themselves against scams and i think just in general our, our education in new zealand around scams and around financial literacy is really low and that makes it a real fertile ground for scammers which is yeah challenging to be you know i don't want my industry to be associated with scams i want all of our customers to be safe but it's a real hard battle to fight that one yeah it must be hard i watch a lot of youtube scam videos as i said before and like when you hear the stories of people who have lost their money and you're like, oh my God, you know, why did you invest all your money in that for a start? But B, like, this is terrible, you know, like how people are just preying on these people. But Absolutely. But I think one of the things that is a positive with crypto is that cryptocurrency, you know, running on the blockchain, it's super transparent. Like you can mm. see every transaction, you can see where everything's going. And I think we're probably in this like the worst of all worlds where crypto is popular enough that people know about it and using it and scammers are all over it, but it's not, um, ad- you know, advanced or adopted enough that we've, you know, we're making use of all the tools that we could do here. Like for example, you know, 
Blockchain is transparent. Every single transaction is visible. You can you can know exactly where you're sending to, unlike with banking. And so that should enable us to stop scams before they even start, mm. right? You know, in your crypto wallet, you should be able to go, oh, I'm sending to this address and your crypto wallet goes, whoa, did you know that's actually associated with XYZ scam? And you'd be like, oh yeah, okay, no, I'll, you know, <laughs> let's, let's not do yeah. that one. And those tools are coming and they're, you know, that stuff's improving all the time. But I think it just like, it needs a couple more years to really mature the, the prevention and, you know, risk detection and, um, you know, information to to you and I about what we're doing so that we can make good decisions yeah. but there's absolutely so much you know the tooling is there the opportunity and like the space can be so much safer than banking which is really exciting yeah I, think, I mean I'm blockchain technology for me is like I, journalism should be on it like anything yeah. where you can solidify where something's happened it's yeah, going to be right. really cool the future it would be awesome to see journalism on it because I think, you know, as AI is getting more prevalent, like that, what can you trust is becoming yeah. more and more challenging. And yeah, you're right. Like blockchain has such a amazing potential solution for that in terms of the origin of information and being able to trace that and verify it. Yeah. And I think like if you look at anything that's been in the, in the past, right, all the cowboys get on initially yeah. and make a bit of a mess of it <laughs> and then it matures and then people start like governments and everything start like saying, all right, we're going to take this seriously. And mm. then you have this period of where it's a little bit more matured and a little bit more stable and people are actually starting to like not just the early adopters are on it anymore. And yeah. so I feel like that could be that could be the like imminent future with Bitcoin. Yeah, I hope so, right? Mm. Yeah. How hard has it been doing Bitcoin in New Zealand though? Like it's like it's not I don't look I'm just trying to think about many other Bitcoin prominent players, you know, in New Zealand. I know there's not many that sort of come to mind. No, and I think, um, you know, blockchain more broadly, like there's amazing opportunity for New Zealand with blockchain and Web3 in that, you know, here is a fully digital product, a fully digital industry. It doesn't, you know, it's not going to have carbon emissions. We don't have to like create primary agricultural mm. products and ship them around the world, right? Like we can do it all from New Zealand. And so I think there's an amazing opportunity for us to leverage that and better, you know, and, you know, um, em embrace that and create a lot of, um, and, you know, economic impact and, um, you know, job opportunities for Rangatahi and like just, you know, there's a really cool opportunity there, but we're not throwing ourselves in it. I think there's part of it is that there isn't been a, a strong view from government on it. Like New Zealand government's actually, you know, really good as far as global mm. governments go. They're really um, approachable and you can sort of work with government on, you know, understanding what applies to the sector and that sort of thing. But there hasn't been a joined up, hey, we should we should create an opportunity, create a sandbox, create an environment where it's good for New Zealanders to start dipping in this. And you do see some other countries have been doing that and are seeing, you know, relatively good success in that. Um, who is out of interest? So you've got countries like Singapore and Hong Kong are leaning in quite heavily. Dubai um, has really been starting to make moves there. Even Australia is talking about it, although Australia has a little bit of a, um, you know, they've got regulators that are creating complexity in the environment similar to what the SEC is doing mm. in the US, but not quite as, as bad. But then you've also got others that are like, hey, let's, you know, get a bit more clarity, put the rules out there, make it, you know, more opportunity in the space. So I think New Zealand being like that, we're such a small economy, we're such a, you know, we've got a single layer of government, there's a real, uh, you know, it's easier to do business here. And so mm. there'd be a really cool opportunity to promote the sector as a sector where, you know, people can come, employment can happen, industries can spring up and yeah, I'd be all for that. Mm, awesome. Hey, I want to talk about remote um, because, you know, it has it definitely has its pros and cons of, mm. you know, having a fully remote workforce. What um, was the reason you went remote? Because your brother was on a beach in Thailand signing himself somewhere? Yeah, and pretty much. <laughs> so we started building the business from two different um, continents and yeah, we just... I think one of our first hires was in um, Bali in Indonesia. Then we brought on a guy in Australia. Then we had one in New Zealand. So we just sort of organically grew in different countries. And I think now we've got staff in seven countries around the world. Yeah. What about the logist logistics of that with payrolling and everything? Did you have to figure that out or did you use like third parties to do it all for you? Or Yeah, a lot of trial and error on that one. And it, it does payroll. It's a huge amount of complexity and also just the legality of employing people. Um, we, when we started, a lot of our people were sort of contractors and, you know, we sort of naively thought that, well, if they're contractors, it doesn't matter. Not the case, mm. right? So if any startups looking to hire globally, probably get onto an employer of record from day one. Like it does cost a bit more, but it just takes away any legal risk. We ended up incorporating com companies in lots of countries, which is actually, you know, it, it meant that we could do our own payroll. It made it simpler, but setting up companies in foreign countries is hard closing them down so much harder as yeah. i'm only just finding out now so yeah that's been a hard one um 
but it also, you know, it does give you a lot of benefit that you can employ people, you know, no matter where they're based, you can access those skill sets. Um, but yeah, there's definitely pluses and minuses. Yeah. Is there much of a like talent base here in New Zealand for the, like the crypto bl- blockchain world? Um, yeah, there's some. Um, what we do actually doesn't like we, we've got some really good crypto savvy and blockchain engineers on board both here in New Zealand and also sometimes we'll contract in resources from overseas mm. um, but I think you know New Zealand's just got great talent in general um, and a lot of what we need isn't actually specifically around blockchain it's all of the you know broader stuff that goes around that yeah just yeah. the web stuff and yeah and, you know yeah um, so one thing that comes up a lot on this podcast is like a lot of people like look at someone like yourself and then they'll say, well, how the fuck does she do it? And does she have everything covered behind the scenes? And, you know, is she, or is she just faking, you know, jumping into a CEO role? Um, and so like the, um, I think that's the one message I'm always trying to push out to people is like, if you, if you want to do something, just jump in and do it and just try and figure it out. And, and I think one thing you articulated really well is that you just slowly start increasing your mm. comfort zone more and more and more until things may not be get, get, may not be comfortable per se but you just find them a lot easier and then things that are outside of your comfort zone look a little bit more attractive because you're like oh i can do this and so has that been your experience of just been pushing yourself to these points or yeah absolutely and i think for me like one of the things that i really like to um sort of like bring others in on the secret on is around imposter syndrome because i think Mm. a lot of people look at stuff and go oh i can't do that i could never it's that's too hard for me or i'm you know i just don't have what it takes and i think none of us do right like you know me five years ago there's no way i could be doing what i'm doing now and no way i would have even thought it would be i would have the you know ability to grow into that right but that thing that you know you're just talking about of you do a you stretch yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone and then really importantly look at it and be like hey how did I do and I was like actually you know that first presentation I gave that I was shitting myself beforehand I got really good feedback on it and people like you did really well and I was like okay I need to take that I need to bank it and then I need Mm -hmm. to you know let that build my confidence for the next time and as a CEO it actually can be really hard because you don't have external people giving you that validation that hey you did a great job so it's Mm -hmm. like I've had to learn to do that to myself to be like okay I stretched myself outside of my comfort zone here how did it go what were the results you know how can I use that to help me take that next you know step out that next step out and just have each experience build your confidence and build your ability to go a little bit further next time and sometimes you know you'll make the choice to step out of your comfort zone and sometimes it gets forced on you but Mm. you know whichever way it is like take that as a learning opportunity and use it to you know be like okay yeah I can do a bit more than I thought I could and actually it worked out well or I you know I made this mistake but I learned from it because you learn you know more from your mistakes than you learn from your successes right it's just that people tend to celebrate and respect the successes and look sideways at you for the mistakes. Yeah, yeah, and you, and you try and push your mistakes down pretty quickly, and not think yeah. about them when you should be like, learn, learn, learn. What did I do wrong? What can I improve? You you touched on something there, like the CEO role is is lonely, right? It's definitely tough. You know, yep. like I have nights where I'm like, oh, I mean, I'm like, I've got a business partner Dan, and I can call up crying at night, and if I want to, and and unload on him. But do you have mentors and people that you work with now that just sort of help you to give you that, like, I think I did this right. Can you send send a check for this for me or? Yeah, I've got like a number of different places that I get that from. And I think it's a really important one, right? Like if you're starting out or in this journey and don't have a network that you can call on to to be really vulnerable and to be really open and get real, you know, core level support, it's super important. So like, you know, try to find those networks. A couple of places I go is firstly my board. I've got a really fantastic board. In particular, my board chair is a huge sounding board for me. Like just on Friday, I was like, we had some meeting and I'd just been come off the back of it. And I was just like, oh, I'm just not feeling sure about this and this. And so I just like swung around to her place, grabbed a coffee, talked through some stuff and just got like a good bit of clarity and feedback that helped me go, okay, cool. Yeah, I can, I can reposition this and I can, you know, mm. um, that's a great relationship. Yeah, super, super good. Um, I've also got a member of YPO, the Young Presidents Organization, yep. and they have a sister organization, EO um, Entrepreneurs Organization, which is a super cool place to get that community of of like-minded business people, of people that you can be really vulnerable and open with about what's going on in your business and your life and get, you know, not advice, because it's not about advice, it's around people understand your journey, sharing their own experiences and, and helping you sort of see a, a broader perspective on, on what mm. you're going through. And then I've also got a couple of communities of um, women in business and, um, you know, women CEOs that are, you know, just awesome groups of people that, you know, really cool support as well. So I'm very fortunate. I've got like a number of places I can go to, but I really recognize how much value that's added to my journey. So totally yeah. encourage people to 
to find those communities and if they aren't in one you know set one up like reach out that's how actually the um the 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 group of women that i'm part of that just happened because someone was like man i want some people to talk to and they just hit up a group of people on linkedin and were like can we get together and everyone's like yeah this sounds awesome so you know if you don't have it find it if you can't find it create it that's how I heard about you in the first place, actually. It was like a whole bunch of women founders kept coming up to me and going, these are the people that you have to have on your podcast, Troy, and like, listed off 10 people. And so I was like, all right, I'm chasing oh, thanks, out. thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, this, this is an interesting topic. And John and I were actually in, I were talking about this just before you turned up. Well, we, um, I think I sent um, Brooke a text message and said, hey, I didn't didn't fully see. I'm not sure if you heard it, but Electrify Aotearoa, she had a really hard conversation with Serge Van Dam, And it was like, for me... I was like, wow, like, I didn't see all of it, but when I heard about the rest of it, because everyone kept coming out after me saying, what's your take on it? I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't know, but tell me. I was like, wow, that's like fucking amazing, you know, like to have these really super hard conversations. Do you know the premise of what happened? I've seen the chatter on, I haven't watched the video, but it was around sort of um, women founders and like the risk. Yeah, so Serge had said to, um, and Serge is a good friend of mine, you know, for what it's worth, um, he'd said to her, Brooke, that um, he tends not to invest in as many women because... Uh, women founders because they don't have the risk appetite or they don't have this and and so it's very brave of Serge to say on stage at um yeah yeah. like well he so he said that to her early right and when early shares his days yeah and then um so then Brooke said well I'd love to talk to you about that now years later up on stage and so definitely brave for Serge to get up and say and, Mm -hmm. and say it and so they had a really robust amazing conversation about it and I was like fuck yeah, like what a cool conversation. But how, like for Brock to get up on stage and like lean into the uncomfortableness of that yeah. and to show how brave founders have to be, you know, and can be was just so good. And I think it's like, it was probably one of the, like it was, it was the first time that I went to a conference that I was like, I wish I should have taken my daughter. My daughter just would have been so inspired by so many women who, you know, are being risky and going after it and have these crazy ideas that, you know, I was just like, fucking, this is amazing. And so... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good to see these community groups and it's good to see everyone now like sharing and supporting each other because it is lonely when you're being risky and you just need some people to tap you on the back sometimes and say, go for it. Yeah. And also it's like, it, it's so cool to have those stories told about publicly, right? Because people often ask me, oh, did you find it hard raising money as a woman? And I'm like, yeah, like I have a number of stories I can tell of like, mm. you know, things people said to me very much along those lines. I had people say to my face, I wouldn't invest in a business run by a woman um, and, you know, other things. And, but in my mind that's always just been the tip of the iceberg right because so few people have a the self-awareness and b the the gumption to actually say that out loud so many other people will think it and not say it or not even realize that they're acting on that prejudice Mm. and so you know there is you know the statistics say that women are massively less likely to get invested in and you know few people put their hands up and say oh yeah i want to invest in a woman-run company but the the stats tell us that actually that is the case right and so it is super hard and talking about it and bringing awareness to it and having people own that and discuss why that decision making process and challenge it like that's awesome yeah yeah i mean that 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 was well i was particularly proud of that conversation i thought from both sides Mm. you know it was like a brave i i love to see discourse you know and i love to see open discourse where we can just get conversations out into the wild and people can you know learn from it which way or other but I wanted to talk about investment because mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, it's definitely, I think I think it is harder for women, it's definitely harder for women to get investment. Being a Bitcoin company might be even harder. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that one you, did not help. <laughs> can you talk through the challenges there? Because I think it's not like you can just back the right coins, right, and raise the money yourself at times, even though a lot of Bitcoin companies did that. But um, yeah, talk me through that process because I imagine it would have been really challenging. Yeah, so it took us... Um we were fundraising for a year before we got a, a lead investor. And for anyone who's sort of thinking about this process or doesn't necessarily understand how fundraising works, it is a slightly weird dynamic. You might be going out to raise, you know, say you want to raise a couple of million dollars, you expect you'll maybe raise it from half a dozen, a dozen different sources. One source needs to put their hand up and sign your term sheet first. And there's this expectation from the other investors that 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 investor will do the due diligence, they'll really run you through the mill and then everyone else can just pile their money in and be a bit lazy about how much they really sort of check you out. 
So you need this lead investor. And it was incredibly frustrating for me fundraising because I had so many people say, oh yeah, we will follow once you get a lead. So it took me 12 months to get a lead investor. And then once I got a lead investor, I was oversubscribed in about three weeks. Um, and it's something that I find really, you know, I don't know if the whole world is like this or if New Zealand's worse at it, but I found it really frustrating that there wasn't any, there, there was a general lack of willingness to own that investment decision. It's like someone yeah. else needs to make the decision and then I'll, and then I'll follow. So yeah, it was really, really difficult. Being a crypto company definitely narrowed our options. And, you know, as we were just talking about, statistics would say that being a woman founder narrowed our options as well, but it's mm. hard to see that you you have very few people that come and say, oh, I won't sign your term sheet because you're, you've got a woman CEO, but you know that, you know, statistically that plays into it. And then also I think just market timing as well, you know, crypto is a very volatile business. And so you have to hit the right timing and yeah. market sentiment, which we eventually did in, in 2021 when we raised. I like look back and I think, I wonder how I'd be in that situation, whether I would be like, fuck you, I'm going to show you to these people that have said to me, you know, I'm not going to invest in you for this. Does it give you fuel to show them or does it piss you off? Definitely gives a bit of fuel to start with, but then I think you just get exhausted with the journey and you go back to doing what you're doing and forget about that stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the investor, external investment things are a really interesting one. Like a lot of, I know a lot of companies really need it, particularly if you're capital intensive or you've got like big, um, you know, growth plans that you have to invest in before you can get the returns. But from my experience, you know, we bootstrapped the business for the first four years we were just like you know whatever money we made we'd reinvest back in or we'd you know pay our own you know pay from my salary to help fund you know the costs and that sort of thing and I think if you can bootstrap it actually it brings you a really good discipline around how you spend money whereas mm. you know for us we had this massive whiplash when we took um, external investment on board because we'd been so cautious around spend and really prudent on what we're doing because we just couldn't you know we couldn't spend more than we had and we also never knew what next month's revenues were going to be because we're such a volatile yeah. industry and then once we raised money we were literally having investors saying to us you have to spend this money as fast as possible we invested in you for growth so go 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 mm. and it's like it possibly wasn't you know I, I don't actually think that strategy is particularly helpful like I think you know you want to supercharge a bit but you don't want to just spend wildly because there's this expectation of the more cash outflows you have the better yeah. you are by some metrics like that's pretty weird right so for us, you know, bootstrapping created a really good discipline around the business. It also meant we were super in touch with what we we're spending, what it was delivering, and it meant that we had, you know, 100% ownership over the business, both in, you know, the equity ownership, but also in the decision making and the strategy and that sort of thing. So for founders thinking about raising, I would definitely challenge them to consider do they need to. I think we have this culture of celebrating the raise like you know when when we did our series a raise because we hadn't raised prior we were the largest first fundraiser in new zealand and it got us great headlines mm. and people like oh easy crypto you raised all that money and blah blah and i'm like in hindsight if i could do it again i probably wouldn't have raised i would have kept bootstrapping but we really celebrate you know that you know i wouldn't be here if we hadn't raised though to be honest like just purely candidly i was like we raised we got headlines i became you know famous ceo mm. fintech entrepreneur woman blah 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 and you know i wouldn't be on the radar if we hadn't done that fundraise but we might be in a better position as a business if we had, you know, had kept our strategy and our um, prudence around how we were spending and growing rather than mm. trying to, you know, take a VC led approach, which is much more aggressive. Yeah, and I think there's some interesting options now too, right? There's not just VC money on the table anymore. You can look at loans, you can look at this, you can look at tractors out, yeah, you've got you can just keep bootstrapping yeah right? it's like, but do you need it that's what yeah. i would always challenge people like if you need a raise by all means go ahead and like you know talk to others who have take the learnings but like do you need a raise and i yeah. think yeah just that culture of celebrating a raise for its own sake is maybe leads to to outcomes that you know yeah you, you want to rethink that as a, as a founder yeah it's funny for me because I, I work with so many early early stage startups sort of like pre-raise or anything and sort of behind the scenes helping them and then all of a sudden you see them blow up all over linkedin yeah. and you're like you know, and everyone's like, oh, overnight success. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think we're in this cool time now where the industry and the economy situation has like really changed the game a little bit where people are asking, thinking about going back to being just like, All right, I'm just going to find product market fit. I'm going to bootstrap it. I'm going to go out and sell the software. I'm going to do this rather than just raising on the back of a napkin and mm. having hyper extend growth. And so I feel like some good startups are going to come off the back of this period that we're in now. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone that's like following your path? Like what would be the top you know, one or two things that you would say, this is something that you should really think about? Firstly, I think, you know, and we've touched on a bit 
but you know that the entrepreneurial journey is so hard you need to have a support network so for me having a co-founder was really really impactful not everyone has the ability to have a co-founder but if you you know if you don't have a co-founder that you that can have your back find that wider support network because it does get really mm. hard and really challenging and you need you need someone who has faith in you when you lose the faith in yourself yeah, yeah. is it easier or harder having that co-founder as a family member I've actually loved it. Um, I found like it's one of the things I've loved most about the easy crypto journey is that it's really brought my brother and I closer together. Mm. Like, you know, we we got on well um, as adults, not at all as as kids, (laughs) Um, but we got on well as adults. But, you know, now, you know, we talk pretty much every day. We're always working on stuff together. We're always like, you know, we just really formed a really good bond. And I think for us, our experience of co-founding together has been that the secret for us has been that we've got very um, different skill sets. Mm. So we don't have a lot of overlap, which means we don't have a lot of conflict. Um, the things that, you know, I'm good at and not his cup of tea and the things that I'm like, I, I don't know how to do that. He just excels at. So that's been a really good secret for us. But I think with any two people, right, if you have the will to make it work, I'm sure you can find ways to navigate through through the challenges. Mm. Yeah. Is it like you mentioned this before, right? Management and leadership, and I, I definitely agree with you. They're fun, like different things, but you know, um, is it easier or harder like managing people that are remote? Do you think? Because there's like le- you can lead a company, right? And everyone can lead a company, but it be remote or mm-hmm. you know. And as it grows up and it's bigger, you can't really get around and see anyone, even if they were in the office. But is it harder or easier? Do you think managing people doing this sort of day to day stuff online? I would say possibly easier or maybe no difference because I'm a really big proponent of you shouldn't be managing based on inputs, right? Like Mm. number of hours that bums are on seats in an office. And this is one of the things that frustrates me with the whole return to work thing. I'm like, it's not about the number of hours that you're spending at your desk. It's about what you're delivering. So you've got, you know, inputs is, you know, the number of hours someone's doing. Outputs might be the number of lines of code they're writing, but the outcome, which is what it's delivering for your customers or for your business is what you should be looking at. So I think with being remote, it probably helps focus a bit more on, you know, we're not going to measure people based on their input. We're going to measure them based on what are we actually looking for as a business. So if at all possible, and maybe let's make this the second point of advice is like, if at all possible, measure and reward um, based on outcomes, because that's really what you want to be driving for and try to drop any concerns about inputs. Like my team, I've got some team that need to work set hours, like our frontline staff, because we have rosters for, you know, being available for customers. But everyone else, I'm like, I don't know how many of my staff are actually working right now. It's like what midday on a on a Monday. I could have thirty percent of my staff at work. I could have a hundred percent of them. At, you know, like I don't actually know because I don't. I don't look at you know what are you guys doing in terms of hours in. Yeah. I look at what are we working on and having real clear outcomes for people to to work towards and measuring them based on that because that's what matters. Yeah, I think fundamentally that for me is success though, right? Is like if everyone's contributing, it doesn't matter what the hell you're doing behind the scenes. As exactly, long, As right. long as you're getting shit done, right? And we're I mean, shipping I, product. I had a job once in corporate where one of my manager literally said to me, he's like, look, you could just work two days a week and you'd be putting out the same output as someone working five. So, you know, just take it easy, don't worry. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, it, yeah, it isn't about, you know, the number of hours in. And if you're rewarding people based on what they're doing, people love a challenge as well and they love to be engaged. So it's like saying to someone, hey, you have to deliver three widgets and they know it's only going to take them half a week. That's not engaging. Whereas if they have the challenge and sort of the ability to, to fill their time with stuff that's that's meaningful and interesting, then yeah. you'll get best out of them. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And the whole, there's this whole 10 times engineer thing, right? The, especially in my industry, I hear it all the time. Can you find me a 10 times engineer? Yeah. And I'm like, I can, but usually they're pricks. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Um, usually they're, they're really arrogant and you can't really surround them with people and the likes yeah. and so if you need one of those I can find you but it's about creating that 10 times engineering culture yeah. which is where the real magic happens and you create that when you allow people to work the, be- the way they work best and whatever that may be some people might like being you know more managed and told what to do some people might uh, like less management and just being able to work three hours a day and do you know 10 hours worth of work in three hours and yeah. so Hey, what does the future look like for you now? Like if you have the crystal ball in front of you and everything goes really swimmingly with the crypto world and the economy and everything, how does that look? I mean, I'd really like us to, you know, to keep growing, but in a sort of a manageable, sustainable way. We're looking at the moment, we're really pushing into Australia sort of second half of this year as our, mm-hmm. as our big push there. Um, I really want to keep building out the tooling that enables people to engage with the space. So, you know, the wallet's a really important part of that, of making it easy and like, you know, we're, that's a relatively new product. So it's still kind of in its infancy and we're like, cool, how do we make it simpler? How do we make it better? How do we really improve mm-hmm. the, the experience on that? 
And then also, you know, with a stable coin like we talked about before, right? I'm like, that's where I'm like, you know, that's got awesome long term potential as as a systems that we're working in change. And I think those things together, you know, we've got these cool building blocks and it's like the fun for me is how do I stitch those things together? How do we, you know, find the right opportunities and market and develop and grow the business into the right strategic, you know, blue ocean spaces that we can really um, make cool things that help make people's lives better. Mm, sounds like you got a lot on. That's like all the things, right? <laughs> Always all the things all the time. <laughs> How do you look after yourself? Um, I've really been leaning into over the last sort of six months or so, a lot more delegation and a lot more blocking out my calendar. So I've sort of, I notionally work three days a week, which yeah. basically means that I have three days of meetings and then I've got two days that have few or no meetings and I can actually have a bit more space to think. And I found that's really, really helpful. Like if you're just head down and, you know, running from meeting to meeting to meeting, like it's hard to get that that strategic space, that creativity, mm. that um, oversight. So that's one of the things that's really important for me is actually protecting my time at work a bit more and realizing that being available for all of the things isn't the most effective thing for me to be doing. Um, personally, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Still working on that one. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think just again, trying to protect my time and, you know, startup world, you end up working nights and weekends and it consumes your life. And like for the first few years of Easy Crypto, I, I really like my social life stuff that I didn't see my friends as much because I was just always building or even when I was hanging out with people, I was still always on thinking, uh, thinking, getting notifications, fighting fires, solving problems. And so trying to carve a bit more of that back and being like, hey, work is work and this stuff's not urgent. It's important, but, you know, it'll wait till Monday. And right now it's Saturday and I'm going to catch up with some friends and I'm going to be present and actually, um, you know, look after myself through being with my community and my mates is real important. Yeah, I love that. I I literally, I think I created my business success off the back of me working seven days a week and being available any time to yeah. clients that would message me at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night and I'd be like actioning it straight away. Yeah. And now I'm like, how do I have success without doing all that work? I love that idea. I'm going to steal your idea of no meetings on two days a week because I just miss having creative thoughts and thinking about the business, working yeah. on the business, not necessarily in the business so much. But yeah, do you have a specific days that you do them or? I do Thursdays and Fridays and actually our whole company is trialing a meeting free Thursday at the moment. Um, for me personally, I find that the, I found it hard to keep those days fully meeting free, like urgent stuff will pop up or things will bleed into them, but it's yeah. like. It's, you can choose them, right? Exactly. And also it's so much better than, you know, previously when five days a week were available for meetings, they would be full and I'd be like having, you know, 10 to 15 meetings every day and it's just like it you're just sprinting the whole time, right? Mm. Whereas being able to step back, I think it it really, really helps with particularly that strategic and creative side, which, you know, you've got to carve out space for that. And it's really hard as an entrepreneur because you've got all of these urgent, you know, the urgent trump and the important happens so much. And it's hard to carve out time for stri strategic and creativity because it's not an agenda item. It's not like a deliverable. It's actually, I just need to be able to, yeah, listen to a few more podcasts, read a few more mm. things, think about what's going on in the industry, try to connect the dots a bit and have a bit of that um, higher level thinking. Yeah, nice. I think space is like the important thing, right? It's just so you can figure out what you need and what you want to look at. There's so much information. There's so many things out there that you can overload yourself these days. 100%. Yeah. Hey, um, on, so on this season um, of episodes, we've been sort of finalizing with a question from a from a previous guest. Oh. And um, this one was, this one comes from, who is it, Jono? Ralph Hyman, who was the CEO and um, co-founder of Volpara the breast screening technology um and he he wants to know so he's just exited mm -hmm. uh, i think i think volpar has just sold for 300 million dollars they um big wellington company done really well and he was like when's the right time he's like God, i think he sort of said this from having some money in his bank now and he's like do i invest in crypto now what's the right <laughs> time and so like give me some advice on like what should should we feel comfortable about investing in crypto right now and so I guess that's a, a question we've kind of discussed, but let's go. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have a lot of people ask me this and generally, um, you know, my, my personal view on it is that there's never a right or a wrong time, right? Um, the most important thing is not to invest more than you're willing to lose, right? Like if you've just exited your business, don't invest the entire proceeds <laughs> of that into crypto. Yeah. Um, but like put in a, like, you know, it's really worth looking at diversifying your investment portfolio, right? So maybe 5% of your total investment or 10%, depending on your risk appetite, you might want to put into crypto because it gives you just like a different exposure to a different asset class, a different, you know, hedge on something different. And the risk at like, you know, a 5% level is probably manageable for most people, right? Yeah. And then if you're looking at investing, like trying to time with the market, like 
don't worry about it, right? It's impossible to do. You can never pick the market. And as the saying goes, time in the market beats time in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I personally, I do and a lot of our customers do for crypto is called dollar cost averaging. So you just invest the same amount, like maybe it's $200 a month or whatever, and you just like, you know, or $50 a week and you just invest a little bit regularly. You're not paying attention to whether the market's up or down. Over time, it averages out and it's, you know, statistically proven to be one of the best investment strategies. Yep. And it just takes all of the emotion and trauma out of it of, oh, like, oh crap, I just bought and then it's dropped 5%. Yep. And like, you know, you just don't worry, you just sit and forget. And it's a real low stress way to, to get in. Yeah, I said forget. I never look at my crypto investments because you know, like some people are like looking every day and they're telling me, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> you're like you're like roller coasters, you know? Yeah, like, I know, right? Yeah. I read a LinkedIn piece, LinkedIn piece on that recently. It's just like sometimes it's better not to be so engaged in it because it, you know, it takes a lot of you know emotional energy and load, right? And like yeah. if you're having a bad day and then your investments are down ten percent, you're like, oh, but it's like they might be up again ten percent next week, and like just. Just take that, you know, stress yeah. out of your life by watching that. Just let them do what they're going to do. And when you need the money, it's there. And, you know, you can figure out what to do with it then. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you're thinking long term, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so then that means that I've got to, I'm going to get a question from you now. Is there something that you would like to ask a guest, even if you don't know who it's going to be? Mm-hmm. Is it what would, what would be the burning question that you would want to know from someone who sort of shared that journey as you? All right. Well, yeah, well, we've talked about investments um, in crypto. And I guess talking about investments in uh, New Zealand startup scene, Who's up and coming, and who's the next big thing that um, you know your next guest thinks might be might be the next big zero or the next big uh, startup out of New Zealand? Who should we watch? How do you? What would you? How would you answer that? <laughs> how would I answer? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go to the Ice House pitch night um, in in August, so maybe I'll I'll give you some feedback after that. But, um, oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Cool. Um, another question. Um, one of the things that I know is super important in startup or any business, but is also incredibly difficult is focus and having like really narrow focus on the few important things that the business needs to do rather than trying to do everything. So I'd love to hear from another guest sort of how they manage that tension because it is so hard not to try to do everything and how they have the, the discipline of focus and, and you know, what's what that has delivered for them as a business. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I love that. I'm, I'm constantly that. challenging, with, um, you know, battling with it myself. I'm like, the fewer things you do, the more you do with excellence. We all know it. It's real proven management theory, but it's so hard, you know, to say no to good ideas, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you hear it all the time, right? You, every book you read, everyone's like, yeah. narrow your focus, pick, you know, yeah. pick a lane and own that lane. And I'm like, oh, there's so many things to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is your brother back on the right time zone now or on the same time zone or are you... Uh, he's in Malaysia at the moment, um, so yeah, it's a better time zone than than the European time zone that he's often in. But um, yeah, I'll be catching up with him next month. Actually, we're going off on holiday with um, our parents, so it'll be nice to see him face to face for for the first time in a little while. Awesome! Hey, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. I know we've been trying to do this for like over a year now, so <laughs> definitely worth the wait. So thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the episode with Janine Granger from Easy Crypto. You have been asking for that episode. I get so many people reaching out and saying, you have to get Janine on the podcast. And it's not because I haven't been trying. We've been trying to link up our diaries. Janine's really, really busy. She's doing great things with Easy Crypto. I'm a really busy, famous guy too, who's time poor. And so when you get these two amazing people, it's just hard to get them in their diaries together. But I'm so glad that... Uh, the truth came out that she was really busy and I finally got time to just, you know, in her diary because I've got lots of time and it was a joy. It was so cool. I I loved hearing her story. She's obviously very, very bright. She's very energetic. She's very humble. And I think she is inspiring so many people. And the reason why so many people are asking about her is because her story was really inspiring. So thanks so much for coming on Janine. Thank you to every one of you that are watching and listening and sharing this podcast. We get such great feedback and we love it. If we don't get back to you on it, it's just because we just don't get the time to get back to everyone, but we do see it and we really appreciate it. And so join the club, follow us below, go and follow or subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or Spotify or whatever it is, share the love and comments, share it around to people and let's help continuing to create such a great ecosystem. Until next time, I'm Troy. Thanks for watching. This podcast is produced by Jono Tucker from Empire Films.